coming up on the Sark Fighter Podcast. I had a strange bump on my nose. It started as a small bump, became a bigger bump. Today, I talk with blogger and fellow Sark Fighter Calvin Harris, whose sarcoidosis first appeared on his nose. Uh, shortly after the biopsy, she said, good news, the biopsy came back negative. I said, but now I need you to get an x-ray. She was like, an x-ray? It's like, the problem's my nose. What do you need to <laughs> examine my chest for? Now, Calvin is tracking and sharing his journey with regular blog updates while attempting to train for and run a marathon. His journey, coming up. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hello and welcome. This is episode 54 of the Sark Fighter podcast, brought to you in part by a grant from A Tire Pharma. I'm your host, John Carlin, and a fellow Sark Fighter. I do this podcast to offer fellow Sark Fighters hope and to help you connect with other Sark patients to hear their stories, understand how sarcoidosis affects their lives, and hopefully, that helps you understand what you're up against, what you're dealing with, and maybe what you need to overcome. And I am recording in my home office in Roanoke, Virginia, my little podcast studio that I've created. My trusty dog, my boxer, Dougal, is actually nowhere to be found this morning because my wife is home, and I think he's following her around hoping for a treat. But my spare dog, Pippa, my little terrier mix, is in and out of the office and looking for pats on the head. So my companion this morning is Pippa. I have a great conversation for you coming up with national blogger and Sark fighter Calvin Harris of New York City, where he is the CFO of the Urban League. So that's a very responsible job, and he is he is quite a guy. Uh, but first, a couple of pieces of information and, uh, and one small meander, if you'll permit me that. And we always talk about reasons for hope here on the Sark fighter podcast. So as you know, ATAR Pharma is an underwriter of this podcast, and their CEO, Sanjay Shukla, has appeared on the program to talk about the promise of a drug that might be able to replace prednisone, in many cases, in the fight against SARC. And we've, it's well established that prednisone is, is not our best friend, even though um, it is very effective. Uh, it has so many side effects that it can be a problem. So ATIRE has released news uh, that what was being called ATIRE 1923 now has a name. And that doesn't happen until a drug is showing a, a great deal of promise. So I want to read you just a very brief section from the news release. And it, it dawns on me what these companies have to go through just to do something as simple as give a drug a name. So the news release says the United States adopted names, that's the USAN Council, and the World Health Organization, who International Non-Proprietary Name Expert Committee, have selected the non-proprietary name Efzofitimod for ATIRE 1923, a novel immunomodulator in clinical development for pulmonary sarcoidosis, a major form of lung disease. So, Efzofitimod will now be the name for ATIRE 1923. Uh, I don't have any idea what the origin of these names are. It's, it always seems like the average person has to sound it out. It's hard, it's hard to figure out where these names come from. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, there's all these councils that, uh, that have to approve it, and that's happened. Uh, in the United States and around the world. And so ATIRE 1923 is now Fsofinimod. Now, all of this follows on the heels of another news release that came out in early January of 2022. So that's about two weeks ago as I speak to you right now. Uh, I'm talking to you on January 15th. So yeah, so, so just, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, ATIRE released this, and it reads, The FDA's Office of Orphan Drug Products 
grants orphan status to support the development of medicines for patients with unmet needs for rare disorders affecting fewer than 200,000 people in the United States. Orphan drug designation provides certain benefits, including the potential for seven years of market exclusivity following regulatory approval, exemption from FDA application fees, and tax credits for qualified clinical trials. So, EFSO or ATIRE 1923, has now got this orphan drug designation, and because it's an orphan drug, fewer than 200,000 people, as we know, sarcoidosis is often called an orphan disease, the company gets certain benefits from the government, so it makes it easier for them to justify the money that is spent to develop, distribute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with the drug. So, um, it's you know that's good news that's good news for all of us who are looking for a company to bring a drug to market that could be beneficial now also uh, in that second release it says clinical proof of concept was recently established for atire 1923 in phase 1b 2a study in patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis the main form of the disease and the company expects to initiate a registrational trial in this indication this year and uh, registrational trials and indications, and it's a lot of fancy uh, wordsmithing there, but basically uh, what that means is they're going forward with another trial, and the good news is is that every time uh, ATIRE 1923, now known as Efsofitimod, uh, takes a test, it's been passing the test, and it has to pass the test to move on to get closer to being something that all of us can benefit from, or many of us could benefit from, and so uh, that is a reason for hope, and uh, I will be reaching out to Sanjay and seeing if he is interested in coming on the podcast again. Um, he may think it's premature at this point. I, I don't know, um, but uh, he's he's certainly been a great supporter of this podcast, and um, very happy to to share that this drug is moving forward. And I will have a, a podcast coming out soon on another company that's working on another drug that's not nearly as far down the line in terms of its promise. Uh, but on the other hand, it's good to know that there are companies out there that are working on drugs specifically for sarcoidosis. Okay. Let me uh, let me share a little backstory about me and some apprehensions that I'm having uh, coming up between now and the next time you will hear from me. Uh, so you hear me on the podcast talking about bicycling all the time and how much I love to ride my bike, and I do. In fact, I... Uh, um, I probably, even though it's only 38 degrees, will take the mountain bike out this afternoon and try and, and ride around Carvin's Cove, which is a, a beautiful mountain bike mecca here in Roanoke, Virginia. But uh, when I was in high school, it wasn't cycling, it was skiing. I lived in central New York, and then I went to college right on the Canadian border in Plattsburgh. I attended the State University of New York, or SUNY Plattsburgh. And that's right on Lake Champlain. So the only thing between us and skiing in Vermont was Lake Champlain. So I basically was able to ski just about every weekend, either in, in upstate New York or we most often we would drive around the lake and go over and ski a different resort in, uh, in Vermont. And I did ski reports on the radio back then. And so I could usually get media passes as a poor college student and didn't have to pay to go skiing because we were doing ski reports. And I, I mean, I, I was into it big time. I thought I would work in a ski resort, be involved with it in some way. But, you know, life came along and I got older and I found some other loves. So be it, right? But um, as you know, one of, the, one of those other loves turned out to be running. I was a marathon runner, but once Sark showed up on my spinal cord, um, I found that my legs just didn't work the way they once did, and running feels awkward and clunky and difficult, and I can kind of shuffle, but, you know, the, the running that I used to do just, you know, it just, it wasn't the same, and I didn't get the enjoyment from it. it, it honestly, it, it, it hurt, and it just, it just wasn't fun. So I don't do it, okay? I just don't do it, and I found the bicycle, and that's been great. So in the last couple of months, I've started working out with a trainer, a personal trainer, sort of my New Year's resolution, and he is pushing me to develop my core muscles, and I told him I wanted to ride my bike faster, so I've been doing some leg work, and, I, you know, I'm about 
six weeks into this right now. But it is helping. I feel I do feel stronger and I feel more stable. So now fast forward to Christmas of 2021. And my sons surprised me saying that we would all be going on a ski vacation at a local resort. So all three of my sons, my uh, daughters-in-law, the six grandkids, my wife Mary and I are all going and and we're going to stay in a a house on the slopes at Wintergreen here in Virginia and they're going to pick up the tab. So we're going to have a ski vacation, a family ski vacation. And I can't wait, but... uh, now I will be skiing really for the first time since sarcoidosis has really laid into me um, back in 2016. So, you know, for me, you know, I was skiing, like I said, every weekend and it was as natural as walking. <laughs> I was, you know, black diamonds and moguls and all, you know, I was, I was, a, I was a pretty good skier. And now I am so nervous, or or at least anxious, because I want to know if my legs are going to do what I need them to do. Will I be able to depend upon the skis to kind of, you know, if you do it right, you just sort of lean a certain way, and then the skis do the work, sort of like the pedals on the bike. You know, you let the the mechanical advantage of of the skis do it for you, and all you got to do is balance. So can I just settle in and believe uh, will will I be able to get down slopes that I used to get down? Will, will I be restricted to the bunny slope, as it were? I don't know. I mean, I know I, I'll be able to get down the hill. It's not like I'll put the skis on and just fall over. That's I mean, I'm not I'm not it's not that bad. All right? It's just not. But this is going to be my first measure of how well I can handle this challenge since sarcoidosis started. And uh, I can tell you that I spend an inordinate amount of time worrying and thinking and having anxiety about this. So I will let you know how it goes, uh, assuming that uh, COVID doesn't raise its ugly head and the slopes don't get closed or everybody in the family doesn't get sick. Uh, that's the plan for next weekend, as I a week from today, as I sit here and, and talk to you now. Okay, so thank you for bearing with me on that. But it's kind of related to my guest today. My my guest is he's inspirational in my mind on the Sark Fighter podcast. Calvin Harris releases a new blog every two weeks about how he is dealing with sarcoidosis. And of course, we'll talk about that. And there'll be a link in the show notes if you want to read his blog. And I definitely recommend that you do. It's called Run Your Own Race. And if you subscribe to something called the Sarcoidosis News Weekly Digest, which is free, you can Google it or I'll put a link in the show notes as well. You, you'll get his blog every two weeks. But Calvin is also a runner. And he's plugging away at it, even though he's on prednisone and even though he has sark in his lungs, so his breathing capacity is greatly reduced. People who are facing those kinds of challenges don't typically go out and say, you know what I want to do? I want to run a marathon. Well, that's what Calvin is attempting to do, and he's very early in that process. So his story of hope and inspiration is coming up on the Sark Fighter podcast. A zombie just feeding at stumbling. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast. Welcome back to the Sark Fighter Podcast. Joining me now is Calvin Harris, a fellow Sark Fighter, lives in New York City, works as the CFO for the Urban League, and he's going to tell us about his blog and also about fighting sarcoidosis. Calvin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John. It's great being here. Sure. So how did you know something was wrong with your body when it started? Yeah, it's, uh, I guess that's the, the big question, really. It was back in just under nine years ago, 2013. I had a strange bump on my nose. It started as a small bump, became a bigger bump. Uh, didn't hurt. It didn't, it was just strange. It wouldn't go away. 
And uh, a friend of mine had mentioned that you know, you've got this bump and it's not going anywhere. And, and honestly, until, until they mentioned it, I hadn't really noticed it, even though I saw myself every day. Sure. Um, so from that, I ended up going to a dermatologist and that dermatologist um, looked at it, thought it was strange. Um, and she took a biopsy. Uh, shortly after the biopsy, she said, good news. The biopsy came back negative. I said, but now I need you to get an x-ray. So I was like, an x-ray? So the problem is my nose. What do you need to examine my chest for? That has nothing to do with anything. She said, just bear with me. She didn't actually say the word sarcoidosis, um, but she said, just get an x-ray and we'll, we'll check it out. So a chest x-ray, got, right? A chest x-ray. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And that for, you know, for so many of us, that's where it starts with that uh, chest x-ray. Chest, chest x-ray came back with, uh, you know, with issues in my lungs. Um, she asked me if I was having trouble breathing. I said, well, I don't think so. But, you know, years ago, I mean, gosh, as a child, I was identified to have asthma. And, you know, who knows? You know, you, you look back and you have to wonder, hey, was it really asthma? Was it, was it SARC? Who knows? Uh, but I said, no, nothing more, no, nothing unusual. Um, but from there, she then sent me to a pulmonologist at uh, at Johns Hopkins, and not the my current doctor, but uh, another one in their in their in their system. And then shortly after, identified that I had uh, sarcoidosis. And then the that by that time it was 2014. Uh, so then the the odyssey began from there. So I, I'll say for me, um, I, you know, perhaps compared to some other stories I've I've heard and read over the years, my, mine was probably a little quicker than than others. It was less than a year from actually going to my um, dermatologist uh, at the time uh, to where we got a diagnosis. But at the same time, it was very confusing. Um, but I, I know enough at this point to know that if I only had to go to two doctors and get one chest x-ray, I got off pretty easy <laughs> compared did. to many other fires. Yeah. yeah, you gamed the system. But I mean, so yeah. obviously what happened is the doctor takes the bump off your nose. They do a biopsy, making sure it's not skin cancer. And they see that they see the granulobas and, and the sarcoidosis bells start going off. Right. Exactly. It's like, okay, well, if he's got it here, it usually then shows up in lungs and let's look, but, but you weren't feeling tired or like you were just walking around. Okay. Right. Yeah, that, that's the thing. I felt at least what I thought was normal. I mean, I, 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 I accept now that I probably already had some diminished lung capacity and it was just so slight at the time that I really didn't didn't catch it. But but uh, and I, I wish I could remember her name because I would certainly give her credit because kudos, because my very first dermatologist thought immediately sarcoidosis after looking at the bump and doing the biopsy. You know, she she pretty much had a ban, uh, you know, a binary thought. It's probably either this or this. And if it's not one of these two, then we really got to start digging. But I know that I was lucky <laughs> that I had a, a dermatologist that thought that place. I mean, so many of us have trouble getting people to believe that we even feel bad. I, at right. the time, didn't even feel bad. J- just had, you know, just just had a, a bump on my nose and, and, and troubled looking lungs. But I, I was I know I was really fortunate that I found doctors immediately. Uh, well, immediately being a year <laughs> who yeah, who right. who believed and, and diagnosed me quickly. So. All right. So now you got the diagnosis. You're feeling OK. Did did sure. the doctor say uh, we got to We got to fight this. Or did they say, let's have a wait and see attitude? <laughs> It was it was a little more leaning on the wait and see attitude. Much of it was really focused on the nose at the time. The dermatologist focused on the nose, and she sent me over to the to the pulmonologist to focus on the lungs. Um, and we also kept my um, my primary care doctor at the time uh, involved. She's actually since been retired. Uh, but the pulmonologist sent me back to my primary care doctor and said, "Okay, you need to make sure your doctor's aware." And again, another one of those. Uh, good fortune sort of situations, my primary care doctor immediately gave me the information to the Johns Hopkins sarcoidosis clinic, where I'm currently a patient. I've been a patient there since I believe 2016. Uh, I might be a little off on that year by, by, right. by a year or so. Uh, but she immediately gave me the, gave me that address and the number. She said, it'll be hard for you to get in, <laughs> but she said, but at least keep this number in if, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So, um, we immediately went into treatment and I think back at that time, we didn't go to, you know, many of the standard medicines we have 
you know, that I'm taking now, but it was yeah. really much of a, of a wait and see attitude. And we ultimately did some uh, pulmonary function tests. Okay. So uh, did, was there a time when you then got worse, got sick, felt like you really were having a bout with this? Yeah, I got to say, and this is, you know, this, this is perhaps good fortune. I never noticed it. Um, the data says I was absolutely <laughs> in trouble. <laughs> the, you know, the, the, you know, we, you know, the first lung test ends up being, you know, the first, you know, PFT really is just your baseline. Um, and then when we went between the two, we saw a decline. I just wasn't feeling it. I just wasn't noticing it. Uh, but the data was definitely showing that I was going in the wrong, wrong direction. Wow. So no pain. I, I've been fortunate that for, for most of my time since my, my diagnosis, my pain has generally been manageable. Um, but the, the, the flare ups for skin and lungs is where my issues have usually been. Really? So what, what kind of flare ups have you experienced? Always on the nose. Always, <laughs> well, no pun intended. Uh, right. it's, it's always on the nose. And I, I have to say that my nose and my lungs are usually the very best indicators of where we don't quite have our, our, our medicine cocktail mix right to where, you know, right now, as, as we speak, I'm going through a bit of a, of a taper of prednisone that is not going well at all. <laughs> and my lungs are telling me that this is not, not working, buddy. <laughs> you, you need to try something else. This is not working well. Uh, so that's usually been my thing. If, 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 if redness develops and it usually starts on my nose, if we don't take care of the nose and we get issues in the eyes and, and the, you know, all around the face, uh, I don't tend to get issues on other parts of my, my skin. So I have the, the pleasure of having it all happen right here where you can easily see it. Um, but usually the, it's the best tell, tell rather of, of where my medicine is not quite right. Okay. So, uh, so you never, you, you're so fortunate that you never like got sick, sick, like some people do, but that's because that's because you were diagnosed early on and, but you no are doubt. taking, you're taking a, a lot of medicine. You're taking prednisone, <laughs> sure. You're, sure. You're, yeah. you're getting infusions regularly. Right. Um, right. so you mentioned, you just mentioned prednisone. I talk a lot about prednisone yeah. on the podcast. Sure, sure. I've, I've had a couple of uh, pretty miserable years, thanks to prednisone. And we've, <laughs> and, and yeah. along with the foundation for sarcoidosis research, we've, we've talked about it uh, quite a lot. And um, so what, what's your deal with prednisone right now, before we get into your infusions? Sure. Prednisone, I'm right now at, uh, actually, we just went up effectively yesterday to uh, 10 milligrams. I'm on the, the lower end of the scale uh, yeah. for, for prednisone. Daily? Uh, I was daily. Yep. Uh, I was at 25. And I think when I first got to the Hopkins clinic, we started at a much higher number. And we've been slowly over the years doing the, a bit of a, a wax and wane of tapering. And then oh, we got to come back up. Uh, literally yesterday, we, we realized that um, we tried to go down to seven and a half milligrams daily, which is my lowest attempt ever. And it was just miserable. I just had no energy. Um, and uh, unfortunately, with prednisone, everything is a real slow climb and a real slow fall off. Uh, I end up being, I'll say, lucky that because I run and exercise so frequently and I'm, I'm a CPA, so I'm a data guy. I like looking at a lot of data, including on my own body. I usually can tell when something's not quite right. So we've tried three, including the most recent, three, no, four, four different attempts to taper off. We've never quite gotten there. Uh, each time we've able to bend a little lower each time, but prednisone on a daily basis is unfortunately a, a friend in quotes, a friend of mine. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you look great. You don't have the moon face. Uh, you know, you don't yeah. have, you don't have some of those uh, nasty visible side effects. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Prednisone. So, yeah. so congrats on that. Yeah. I know I'm lucky in that regard. Thank you. Right. All right. So then you're, you're, but you also get a monthly infusion. Uh, it, sure. it, now it was Remicade. And it was then you, you right. had some insurance troubles. So tell us about that. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, this, this is a familiar refrain. So, uh, in, in fact, I'm having an insurance issue right now. I won't name the company, of course. Uh, but what we found is every single time we've had a switch of insurer, I have to go a month or two if I'm lucky, uh, delaying my monthly infusion. Now, for me, the infusion has been the game changer. Um, the moment I went on first Remicade and now I'm on Inflectra, although I have a infusion scheduled for Monday, we haven't been able to resolve with the new insurance company, effective 2022. Um, the moment I went on the, the infusions monthly basis, I was able to really ramp down the prednisone and even ramp down. I also take methotrexate uh, right now, five milligrams uh, a week. We're able to reduce that a bit. Uh, Plaquenil, unfortunately, didn't do anything for me except make me feel bad. Uh, but the biggest thing I'll say, at least from the from the infusion, whether it's been Remicade or now in, in, in Flexra, it's made a remarkable difference on my skin. Uh, and when I lived in Maryland, as you mentioned, I live in New York City now, I'm a, but I'm a Marylander. I, I grew up in Maryland and lived in Maryland up until 2019. Um, I would have to go every two months, every three, three months to the dermatologist and they would you know, shoot a needle into the the issues on my skin, usually right in my nose. Once they did it right in the corner of my eye, I be, I became very comfortable with needles. I I, I will say, uh, yeah. because they put needles in places where you wouldn't want, <laughs> you certainly wouldn't want them. But I have to say, those injections always worked. But the infusions clear my skin up so much that I only go to the dermatologist just for a check in. Um, yeah. You know, once every six months, once a year, just for them to give a, a quick view over. But I found for me, as long as I do the infusions, everything able to, every, all of my results are better. All of my outcomes are better with infusions. All right. Well, let's, I want to shift gears a little bit then. So we now, now we know what's going on with you, but you, you know, you're doing a lot of different interesting things in your life <laughs> and in the sarcoidosis space. Uh, thank, and you, thank. one of the things you do is you blog every two weeks, you come out with a new blog and right. it's distributed by Sarcoidosis News, which is how, uh, you know, I came across you. Um, so tell us about your blog and why you feel compelled to share your story. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's the, the blog is called Run Your Own Race. And it's a it's a play on literally my my own running journey. Um, I was not a runner growing up. I, I you know I exercise as a child, as a as a young adult, not so young anymore. Uh, but since COVID began, I actually started running in earnest because it was one of the few things that my doctors said, "Hey, if you want to move and stay active." Um, that's one of the things that's okay for you to do. You know, you stay distant, stay masked up. Running with a mask is quite difficult, <laughs> but uh, but it's one of the things they allowed me to do. And through that, I just became uh, really excited and passionate about about running. So my, the, but I also re accept that both as a, a a guy over fifty and with uh, Sark lungs, I, I I shouldn't expect to to to. <laughs> break any records uh, other than right. my own but run your own race is, is a play on that that frankly that doesn't matter is that when you have sarcoidosis or wherever you are in your life what's more important is the the race that you're running for yourself and if you're slower than other people who cares if you're faster than other people who cares all that really matters is that you're doing the best that you can with what you have so um, run your own race is a, is a play on that. I, I do talk about running. I do talk about exercise, but, but more often than not, I just talk about my perspectives of, um, particularly in living with, uh, sarcoidosis. So I've been doing that twice a month blog, uh, for sarcoidosis news, uh, excuse me, sarcoidosis new dot, dot com, uh, twice a month. And I've been doing it since the fall of 2021. So it's a, honestly, for me, it's a great, a great outlet um, you know, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's not positive, but Hey, when you, when you have this condition, some days aren't positive and there's no point in pretending otherwise. So I, I, uh, I admittedly have learned that my process is that I wait until the very last minute, uh, to write it. I, I I'm not a person who likes to procrastinate, but I find that the, I I'm able to be the most organic and authentic when I write, when I just wait until the last minute and whatever I'm feeling 
at deadline is what I write about. So it's it's uh, it's been all over the place. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's silly, sometimes it's just giving credit to people who have been there for me. Um, sometimes it actually is talking about running. Um, I suspect that my next one will probably talk about um, my my tough attempt at this last tapering <laughs> event, which has not gone well, um, which so many of us know about, trying to taper and trying to get off medicine, trying to get off prednisone. Um, but yeah, I, I just love doing it. And uh, I, I feel real fortunate to be able to do that. And I, I should also add, part, part of the, the reason I very much enjoy doing it is that I've, I can't remember exactly who, because there are probably they're just too many other people, is, you know, as I've been on my journey with, with, with Sark, there have been countless people along the way, some doctors, some, some not, some medical professionals, some not, who have just, you know, inspired me to keep going. And more often than not, they had no idea they were doing it. But I always felt a little better when I saw people just being authentic about what they were we're going through with this condition. And there are just a bunch of times that I frankly was able to keep going because I saw that I wasn't alone in, in this struggle. So now I'm not, I don't presume at all that my my blog does that, but but I'm but I'm hoping that at least one person can see that there are still things and, and heck with, with Sark, sometimes it's a crapshoot to be honest, what we're all, what we are able to do and what we're not. Um, but that it's, it's okay to feel whatever way you do. And that there are a lot of us that are still trying to figure it out, even if we've had this condition for years. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Well, I, yeah. Um, so I, I would say that this podcast and your blog serve similar roles within each of our lives. I, I'll just, right. I'll just put that out there. But now we're fairly early in 2022, and yes. your most recent blog uh, talked about how your fitness activities have helped you fight sarcoidosis. <laughs> right. And so yes. I thought maybe as you know, people, it's, it's almost getting too late to make New Year's resolutions, but it's still <laughs> that time of year when people are trying to get their life on straight for the coming year. That's right. Um, That's right. So, so how do you, how do you, uh, Let's let's talk about your weight loss story because that's pretty significant. You're a big guy, but you and you're a yes. vegetarian, right? I am, yeah. Since so, uh, ninety two, yeah. So and I, you know, I never heard of an overweight vegetarian. I know it happens. Of course, <laughs> I'm proof. But, you know, most of the vegetarians I know are are really skinny, kind of like you yeah. you look right now. So let's yeah. let's walk well, people you. through how you approached exercise and weight loss and eating right and your. Um, your S E E your C program, because yeah. I think that's something that people could grab onto. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And and you're right. My, my, my most recent one was talking about that. It felt right to talk about that during time that people do resolutions. I will admit that I tend to shy away from resolutions versus just making it. If you want to make a change, make it at any time. So I'd say it's not too late to, to resolve to do differently, regardless of what time of the year it is. But in, in that story, the true story, uh, a friend of mine, um, had poked me in the stomach <laughs> as I was picking up a donut, uh, saying that I had gained the weight. Now, it, 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 it was a bit of a cruel joke, but it was, but I, honestly, I laughed at it because it was funny. But I got to admit that little joke was an eye opener because I somehow hadn't realized, despite my suit being very tight that I was wearing at the time and saw pictures and I stepped on the scale and I was 272 pounds. So I'm 6'3", 6'4", um, seemingly depending on the day, <laughs> right? But, um, but that was way too much weight for my body. And I resolved to uh, lose weight. So um, I, I, I had this, this plan for just losing weight. And it was, uh, you know, SEE. -E. But the, but the main thing in it was to, you know, focus on what I was eating, and focus on on exercise. Those were the were the, the really big two things to do. Uh, but to really be mindful of what I was doing the the whole time, um, and just recognize that you have to be consistent while you're while you're doing it, and accept where you are. And I have to admit, with just that really simple plan of just being mindful what I eat, you don't have to you don't have to deprive yourself. I choose to be plant based. But maybe that's not for you. So you absolutely don't have to be a vegetarian or vegan or plant-based to lose weight. Um, you do have to be mindful of what you eat and and move your body to whatever extent you can. Now, I know this is really tough 
can, this can be really, really tough for us in the SARC community. I'm able to run and run slowly, but I'm able to run. I realize a lot of us can't do that. And that's perfectly fine, but it's whatever we can do and giving ourselves the, the, the comfort and the grace to accept that whatever we can do is whatever we can do. It took me a long time to lose what ultimately ended up being 42 pounds. And I've pretty much kept it up. Um, I'm sorry, pretty much kept it off and kept my exercise running since then. But what ended up, but what ends up happening and, you know, it's part of the thing. And in retrospect, I wish I had talked about this part a little bit more in, in the blog is that that was also before I was diagnosed. Um, and that was also before prednisone came in my life. So I realized someone here and say, well, Calvin, how the heck can you lose weight with prednisone? I've actually done it. I've done it a few times on losing weight on prednisone, but it's a lot tougher to do. Ooh. You just have to be really careful on, on what you eat. And I'm not going to propose or suggest what your, what your eating plan should be. There are lots of good ones out there, but when you get right down to it, do it in consultation with your doctor. Everything I've done, every single thing I've done has always been in consultation with my doctors at, at the clinic, um, including running. She, she's given me the go ahead to run. She gave me the go ahead to run the half marathon and the marathon I hope to run. Uh, but everything, just do it in, in moderation and just do it over time and be patient. And that's so tough. Everyone wants to lose the weight immediately. I'm a little heavier than I want to be and I want to lose it immediately. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works safely. And just do it slowly and you, you, you can get to whatever your best self is. So you have run three half marathons. Congratulations. Right. Thank you. And and now, and a half marathon for our, our listeners that don't know is 13.1 miles. And right. then our, uh, and then you have now qualified to run the New York City Marathon. Congratulations yeah, on that. 26.2 <laughs> miles. But oh boy. <laughs> your listeners know that, that I have done that distance and I and I will just tell you. Congratulations and good luck because it's yeah, for sure. hard. It is yeah. hard, you know. And so, um, and then you've got sarcoidosis on top of that. So, I want to ask you about your training, but I, first, I want to ask you about philosophically yeah. is there are so many parallels between the difficulty of distance running and living with sarcoidosis that I Isn't have. Isn't that found. the truth? Yeah. It's so, so, why true. don't you yeah. why don't you just share one truism of the difficulty of approaching both? Yeah, you know what? If there's one truism, and I could not agree more in terms of the parallels, and I think that's part of why I, I end up loving loving it, is that you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days when you train. That's that should sound familiar <laughs> to those of us here. Yesterday, uh, for to, you know, to be completely transparent, I had an awful day running. Uh -huh. I, I was only doing, you know, I realized only I was only doing four miles, but it's a a, a distance I've done tons of times. I couldn't even finish the first mile without running. Well, we're trying without walking rather. Well, we're trying to do a taper and realize, oh boy, this taper really isn't working. And you know, you, you start having these terrible thoughts. Well, good grief! If you can't even run one mile, how in the world do you think you can do 26? Of course, I'm forgetting that I still have another 15 weeks of training, and this was just one bad day. And those bad days are gonna gonna happen. And unfortunately, you have to put those bad days behind you as quickly as you can, and just say, hey. I was off today and it, I don't, that doesn't mean I'll be off, off tomorrow. Uh, but I've learned to accept the process of running as long as it may be. And also I've accepted also that if I do the training program at whatever pace I can do it, whether it's slower than I want or, ha hey, great, faster than I want, the odds are really in my favor that I'll be able to finish the race. It's no guarantee. There is no guarantee whatsoever. But if I do the right things, and do them when I'm supposed to do them, how I'm supposed to do them, I have a really good chance of pulling it off. And I got to admit, for every single half marathon I've done, I can't, I can't, uh, not afraid to admit, every single time I've, I finished, I was rarely able to do it without, without uh, wet eyes when it was all done. Each time, even though I had trained all the way up and I knew I'd done everything and I should be able to finish the 13, but every single time it was done, it was just like this emotional moment. It's like, my goodness, I can't believe. I've got these lungs and I just ran 13 miles. I ran them very slowly, <laughs> right? but right. I ran them. Right. I, I somehow did it. So for me, it's, it's honestly me fighting Sark. Um, you know, it may or may not win most days, but you know, for that day, 
I'm going to fight it. And I, I don't care how, how slow the, my very last mar- half marathon I did, it ended up being a really poor day. <laughs> it was in the high eighties. And, you know, as a, as a runner, uh, you know, you often feel, I think what, 10 degrees higher than what you're actually running. And oh, I was, I was suffering. It was awful. And thank goodness I had a, a good friend of mine who I I met here through one of the, the, the studios, uh, at least with Peloton, had, had volunteered to run with me the last five miles. I kid you not, I would not have finished without him. So for me, that's another parallel that in, in our Sark journey, for as much as we want to and sometimes feel like we're alone, there are times where we just simply need other people to make it through. Yeah, did I have it in my body to finish those last five miles? Yes. But my mind was telling me the whole time, it's okay if you quit. <laughs> it's okay if you walk. And hey, that would have been okay. If I had to stop, that honestly would have been okay. But having someone with me just got me there. So there, there are just countless places where in the running, the good times and the not so good times to where it's just a natural parallel to, to fight in this condition. So you now, so you tell me you did not walk. You kept running the whole time. Is that what you're saying? I did. You would have yeah. seen walking as, as a bit of a fail? I, I wouldn't have seen it as a fail. I would have seen it as disappointing for Dis- sure. For, for, Cause um, it wasn't your goal. Your goal was to wasn't do it my without goal. walk. But no, I, 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 my whole thought is that I don't know who I'm borrowing this phrase from, but if I couldn't run, I was going to walk. If I couldn't walk, I was going to crawl, but I was determined to get to that 13.1 miles. So for me, walking the rest would have absolutely not been a failure. And I did stop a few times, uh, but it was because I was also determined to not just suffer through no pun intended the run i wanted to make sure i took a few pictures along the way even if it was just a really quick stop and you try to steady your hand while you're tied pull out the camera you know quick yeah. quick picture that those are real important to me as well so that i can look because there are certain pictures i've seen there was one when i was right in front of a hospital go figure <laughs> in coney island with yeah. with my buddy and we were i think uh two miles from the end and I could see in my eyes that, oh, my gosh, <laughs> this guy's ready to stop. <laughs> yeah. okay. But he kept running. Yeah. OK. All right. So, you know, for me, uh, because the listeners have heard me talk about my bicycle. Um, yeah. And I use bicycling as sort of like my body's thermometer. So if I have, yeah. a, you yeah. know, a good day on the bike then I'm having a good sarcoidosis day. And if I go out and I'm suffering or whatever, I can't ride, then I I just know that my health isn't where I want it to be at that given point in time. So do do you do sort of that same thing? Do you have a sarcoidosis read on your running? Uh, Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I mean, heck, that happened yesterday. Yeah. Because my run was so off and I know I've been tapering and I know because of the prior experience of, you know, a few other tapers that in every time you don't want it to happen, of course, but I knew it every every prior taper. There was a point where I was like, OK, we're close, but this just isn't working. And we, we've got to ju- we've just got to go back up to try to find a new baseline. Yesterday was that day because the run was so difficult and the conditions weren't that tough. You know, it was uh high 30s which i know for some people that's not i've I've suddenly get somehow gotten used to running in the high 30s and i don't think that's a big deal um but i knew the conditions were really great for me to run and my body was not cooperating so that was a gauge and i can say for my my um another taper uh, about two years ago i had the same thing in that case i was doing a you know an exercise bike a peloton bike and i could actually look at my day and i was like well i'm doing the same exact rides later i'm feeling good but my numbers are way down so that was also a gauge. So I absolutely, to your point, exercise for me, irrespective of what I'm doing, is not being a great gauge for how my body is functioning with Sark. All right. So you got to follow me. I've uh, I also have a Peloton, and I'm Sark yeah. fighter. So follow. So, okay. So and then so we got to you know we got to do the social no media problem. thing on you know, Done. everywhere. Done. Inclu- so Sark fighter on, and I've never I keep forgetting to tell listeners that if they've got a Peloton that you know I'm Sark fighter. So just just follow along. Um, absolutely absolutely okay so now you've got it seems to me that having sarcoidosis in the lungs and running would be just not conducive so do you and (laughs) and people who are not runners don't understand how you can run for four five six hours and not be out of breath and now you've got now you've got your lungs clogged with this goo right yeah so what 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 do your lungs feel like when you're running yeah my my lungs tend to feel a little tight um okay 
at a certain point, I know, okay, this is too far. There's a, there's a baseline of tightness that I've learned to accept and kind of um, relax through. I, I've learned that, and, I th- and I've, I've, I've talked to you, you tell me if you agree with this as well. I've, I've heard from other runners, and I certainly found it to be the case for me, that miles one and two are completely irrelevant for me. I will always feel off in that first mile for sure, usually that second mile, but right around mile three, and I know this may seem sound strange to non-runners, right around mile three, all of a sudden, just everything opens up. And suddenly, it's not like an adrenaline thing, but all of a sudden, it's so easy to breathe. And it's the strangest thing, <laughs> it's the strangest thing in the world. So I, I, I've learned to ignore whatever I feel in, in, in mile one and usually mile two, but if, at mile three, if I still feel a little off, and like, oh, this might not be a great day. That happened yesterday. That actually happened at the end of mile one. I was like, well, gosh, I can't even run uh, or even jog this one. Um, but I've I've learned to listen to my lungs. That's the exact quote of what my doctor told me at the Hopkins Clinic when I told her I was running my first half marathon. Admittedly, she had this look of panic on her face <laughs> because I didn't come in as a runner. And here's this guy with, with these bad lungs saying, oh, you know what, I'm going to run a half marathon. She's like, oh, okay, listen to your lungs. Now, I, I have been a, you know, a patient of hers for a while, so she knew I wasn't, uh, I wasn't irresponsible or, or you know, just taking risks. I was, and, and I've done that. There, there are times, and you know, it happened yesterday to where I was like, gosh, we, we just can't make it happen today. We're just a, just a little off. And then, then we just, we, we adjust as we need to. But um, I, I do pay a lot of attention to, you know, you know, the phrase uh, RPE, uh, you know, uh, rate of perceived exertion. I pay a lot of attention to that in terms of just how I feel, uh, irrespective of how my lungs are feeling. And, and then I just kind of take it day by day. Wow. So, and, and for, again, for, for listeners, what you do is, is you don't, you don't just get up off the couch and go out and run 13.1 miles. You, you, you <laughs> build, you build yeah. up to it. Right. So, yeah, so absolutely. you do progressively longer and longer runs on That's weekends right. with sort of That's maintenance right. running during the week until, absolutely. you know, if, so if you have run 10 miles, then when you line up to do 13, uh, on race day, if you've trained appropriately, you can do the 13, you can add on the, the last three and, and, and you can, exactly. do okay. and just exactly. like with, with running marathons, you, you usually, uh, don't run more than 20 miles in training right. to complete right. 26 on race day. Um, right. so, uh, but that, that, uh, I actually had not heard, I've, I've used perceived exertion before, but I've never heard the the term so you called it rate of perceived exertion yeah and i and i may be botching it yeah i might no, be botching no no that sounds that sounds bit. good but uh, yeah. but yeah it's definitely perceived exertion i've learned that to be a critical thing for me because there will be some times where i look at the data after I, I have all sorts of fitness trackers and heart rate monitors on me when i'm running i, I like looking at the data after time and there'll be some times where i'll see well gosh my heart rate is a little higher than i expected it would have been but I felt fine. And sometimes I see the ax- the, a- the absolute inverse where I was like, well, my body's saying it was a, it was a piece of cake, but boy, oh boy, it felt tough. That was honestly yesterday. Um, the, the numbers said I was, you know, just doing a normal four mile run or my normal, but it felt like I was about to <laughs> felt like, a, felt like it was, it was all, it was, we were going to have to walk the whole time, which I, I ultimately did for much of it. So that, uh, I find that to be very interesting. Interesting. So, I, so all right, I'm, I, and I'm going to explain this along because by now a lot of our sarcoidosis people who are listening for that reason are like, oh, John's doing a deep dive into running. But this all relates back to what you're doing and and the fact that you have sarcoidosis in your lungs. So true. you have your rate of perceived exertion, which is kind of how you feel in the moment. Then you have right. your heart rate tracker. So for people right. who don't know a lot about heart rate, usually – the, the formula that everybody uses is your maximum heart rate is the number 220 minus your age, right? right. Yep. So you're over 50. Yep, 52. Right? Yep. 52, okay. So I'm not going to do all that math in my head, but your maximum, <laughs> you, when you're looking at your heart rate and, and you're running, you want to keep that that beats per minute somewhere in a percentage of your maximum. And the closer you get to your max, your maximum heart rate is an all out sprint. 
right? That's right. And you can only do that's that for exactly hundred right. yards if you're lucky. Yep. Uh, if you're so, lucky. Yep. Right. So you want to keep backing that down, backing that down, backing that down to where you can run comfortably at a percentage of your maximum heart rate. And you're, and you're exactly. looking at, do you know what that number is for you? Um, my percentage, I, I tend to, I actually don't know the number exactly, but I do find that my 60 to 70 percent is where I like to be. I don't yes. feel too rough in, uh, when I go that period. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. So that's good. So, but yesterday you had a bad day, but you were still in that 60 to 70%. So exactly. that's just a bad, so that's how, you know, you know, if you, if yeah, something else, right. if you were sick, your heart rate yeah. would have just jacked, but it didn't. Right. So, so that right. was just a bad day. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it becomes really important and, and this is where running or, 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 any exercise can be so helpful in this is that, you know, look, I'm clearly a numbers guy, but I have just as much respect and focus on, on the quantitative. I think when it comes to Sark, it's just as important to see what the numbers say versus how I feel um, in my head. There are times where my tracker says, you're actually not that recovered <laughs> and you're still sleeping. I'm like, but no, I'm not. I feel great. And I'll go out there and have a, a great, a great run, great exercise. There'll be other times where it says you are primed and ready to go like yesterday. And nope, that was not the case. So, you know, there'll be times where, and this is where running I or, or any exercise, I found the same thing when it came to being on the bike, on the Peloton, be even, even strength work to where as much as I personally like to focus on the numbers, that it's, it's equally important to focus on the just simple question, how do you feel while you're doing it? Because that can be just as important to know. Do you feel like when you successfully complete a run or a running project, which is a whole bunch of runs that lead up to yeah. a half marathon, do you feel like you're kicking Sark's butt? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, I am, it is not lost on me that what I'm able to do is not the, the norm. Now, that said, I don't think there's anything special about me. I think I'm just fortunate that my version of Sark allows me to do this, even if it is quite honestly a lot slower than I want. Uh, I will say though, I kind of had the benefit <laughs> of not being a runner earlier in life. So I have no baseline. I, I'm not a guy who used to be able to run, uh, making up a number here, an eight minute mile or a sub eight minute mile. And now I'm on a day like yesterday, I was barely able to do 13. It was, it was really rough. My normal pace is somewhere around 10 to 11 and no one's gonna say you're you know blowing the doors off. But um, I don't have anything to compare it to. So in some ways, I'm kind of lucky to have started running later because my baseline is a Sark lungs baseline. So it, it ends up being helpful because I don't know what I could be. <laughs> right. I don't know right. what I was from the past. I just know what I am now. And, and you know, I find uh, that to be important with Sark as well, to just accept where you are now and do what you can now. And, and that's, that's so important to keep that perspective because I've had folks here on the podcast who have a hard time getting out of bed and walking to the kitchen because they, they can't breathe. They don't have the energy. They don't have the capacity. They don't even have the energy to think about. They can't imagine going out to run because it's, that's overwhelming. Right. I can imagine. Yeah. So every, everybody's got to, like, as you say, run your own race. That's right. right. That's right. Take your own journey with Sark. It's a snowflake disease. It affects everybody differently. But so differently. But you know, my doctors tell me, you know, stay on that bike, you know, exercise all you can, hike all you can, do whatever you can, because That's you right. don't want to wake up one day and say, Wow, I don't feel good. And you go to the doctor and now sarcoidosis is is in another part of your body, right? Right. So true. Yeah, that's very true. And and um, you know, the the unfortunate reality is that that we all have with Sark at least I do, is that I, I have in the back of my head that I know that that's always possible, that there could be a day where suddenly something changes. And you know, heck, that's not fair. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not fair. It's easy to, to feel that way about it. I, I, I certainly do sometimes. Um, but I, 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 I'll say running and exercise, and frankly, a lot of people that I've met uh, have helped me to maintain the perspective of just do what you can on a particular day. There are times, even with the running, to where it's enormously tough to get out of bed to even get to my favorite coffee in the morning um and i i just get and sometimes i need to give myself a lot of time before i can even run there sometimes i say you know we're just not going to be able to do it today it's just not going to happen um 
and you just have to kind of accept that that's where you are and you just do what you can do on a given day. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. So if people want to want to hear, uh, read your blog, how, how do they subscribe? How do they click? Where, where do they find it? Absolutely. You can go to sarcoidosisnews.com. Um, it's a part of bio news, but you go to sarcoidosisnews.com and you'll see me and a lot of other great columnists there uh, talking about their SARC journey. Uh, on social media, all of my social media is Calvin HJR, my full name, Calvin Harris Jr. So Calvin HJR, I, I often post on Instagram about SARC on Facebook about Sark, uh, not as much on Twitter, uh, on Sark, but all of my, all of my social media has that same, uh, Calvin H J R, uh, handle. And, uh, you mentioned Peloton. I'll give my leaderboard name. It's, uh, Calvin F N Harris, Calvin F N Harris. I'll leave it to you to figure out what the F N stands for, but it's a, it's a, it's an inside, but probably pretty obvious joke. <laughs> I love <laughs> on, it. On I love it. I love it. Well, Calvin, thanks for joining me on the Sark fighter podcast. Good luck to you, you. And, uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll be looking forward to you talking about completing your upcoming marathons. Absolutely, thank you, John. Great talking with you. I feel like a zombie, just feeding at stumbling. Thanks so much to Calvin for taking the time to talk with me here today. I wish him well as he begins to train for that upcoming marathon. And I believe he told me that he's going to do a smaller marathon in terms of the number of participants, sort of like a he's going to do a, he's going to train for the New York marathon by running a different marathon. I guess he, I guess he wants to see if he can do it before he shows up for the big show. Um, and, uh, of course the New York city marathon is one of the biggest, and I have not run that one myself. And if I, if I were to ever find the legs again, I might get back into, uh, and I wanted to try a marathon again, which seems very unlikely, but New York would be, would be something that I would want to do, but that is a lot of training and go get them, Calvin, go get them. And I wish you well. And if you want to uh, share your progress with us, uh, we will definitely, definitely um, keep the listeners updated on on your progress. A reminder, the official Sark Fighter song is called Zombie by Mark Steyer and his band, The White Hot Lizards. You can hear Mark's story, the story behind the lyrics in episode 12. He also was an athlete, by the way. He was uh, uh, playing hockey, and all of a sudden, he just couldn't go anymore, and they started looking around his body, and yeah, they found sarcoidosis. So, um, that's his story, but he's also a wonderful musician. And uh, if you go back to the end of episode 50, you will hear I play. So occasionally, I'll play the entire song. And it's just it's just interesting to go back and listen to the whole song. Um, so go back and, and maybe give that a listen at, at, on episode 50. Uh, I call this the Sark Fighter podcast, of course, because I'm fighting Sark. So are you, whether you're a caregiver, a patient, a researcher, uh, a doctor, and uh, I just want everybody in the sarcoidosis space to know that there's reason for hope. We're working on that here. We work. I work very closely. I'm a volunteer on several committees with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. I've just been named, in fact, chair of the Patient Advisory Committee. Uh, so recently that we haven't had a meeting yet since I've been uh, selected to be the chair. But the point is, is that uh, there's a lot of us out here working on different reasons for hope. And uh, that's that's what I try to talk about here. If you are new to sarcoidosis and you just Google around, you're trying to figure out what SARC is, go back and listen to episode two with Dr. Simon Hart from the UK. That's one of the most listened to episodes. And he goes over sarcoidosis 101. What is it? What's it, you know, what's it look like under the microscope? Where is it, you know, is it to the best anybody knows, which nobody knows for sure. Where does it come from? How does it get into your body? How does it move around? All those things. How serious is it? Um, Dr. Simon Hart is the guy. My story is in episode one. The backstory to the founding of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is episode 11 with Andrea and Redding Wilson, the people who sat down at their kitchen table and started the foundation. You can send me an email. It's in the show notes, carlinagency at gmail.com. You can follow 
The Sark Fighter on Instagram and Sark Fighter on Facebook, but on Instagram, the word the is in front of Sark Fighter, and I appreciate you following along. And I appreciate your interest in the Sark Fighter podcast. It helps me to reach more people and grow the show. If you'll share it on your social media, grab the link, just put it out there and say, hey, I was listening to this guy, and he's talking about sarcoidosis and... You need to listen too. Uh, that that helps. All right. And if you like the show, just tell one person. Just tell somebody else in the sarcoidosis space. Give the show a nice review wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks again to Calvin Harris for joining me here today. Good luck with the marathon, Calvin, and the training. We hope that goes well. And folks, until next time, keep fighting. Learn to suffer. You feel pain someday. You learn endurance. Your strength will fade. Trying to keep up the pace